So who am I? I'm Warren Walensky. I'm the founder of uh, Plank, which is a uh, digital agency, digital studio from Montreal. Um, and we've been working for 15 plus years on building web projects, uh, mobile, tablet, but specifically, easiest way to describe what we do is we build websites. Cool. So at what point in your life did you realize that you were actually in charge, that right. you were the leader of this, this insane thing? Well, uh, honestly, I would say like we're 15 years in, the five year mark was when I realized it took five years. So when we started the company, um, it was with another founder. Uh, she left at about year four. Mm -hmm. And about year four, when she was in the process of leaving, it became clear that up until then, we were kind of running the business, was a hot potato, we were passing back and forth, and neither of us was really owning. We both were communication graduates, and we figured we were just gonna run a little company, just not work for somebody else, and everything would just work itself out. Um, and then when she left, suddenly I was holding the potato myself, and I realized, okay, is this really a company? Am I gonna try to run it like a company? And when I got to that point, and I realized that, that's when I owned it, and that's when I suddenly realized I'm running a company at that point. And, and how did you then either adjust yourself as a person, yeah. or your leadership style to accommodate for that realization? Well, the first thing is that, you know, I think the reason that I was resistant to running a company at that, up until that point, is that I didn't see that as a creative endeavor onto itself. And then at that point, I suddenly realized the process of running a business was that creative project itself. So it wasn't the project in the office that I was working on. I was now working on the company as a creative project itself. So once I wrapped my head around it that way, that's when it became clear to me that I could actually own that and be comfortable with it. And it meant that I would choose to own finance and administration and business development and marketing, even though we do so little of it that we barely do any marketing at all. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I took it at that point and it was, that's what made me realize it. Were there skills that you didn't have that you needed to learn and, and how did you fill those gaps? Um, the skills that I needed to learn was probably more confidence rather than skills. In other words, uh, I needed to build the confidence that I could do business development. I needed to build the confidence that I could be a leader. Even though I had had experience and I come back to it and I've blogged about it before, I learned so much of my leadership skills at summer camp where mm -hmm. I learned them through um, a different prospect, not marketing leadership, not business development, but kind of people management. So it, it took me a while, but it, it's once I internalized that, I realized that I could do it and I built the confidence myself, I was able to run with it at that point. So you didn't rush off and buy a whole lot of books and, and educate yourself that way, it was more of an evolution. I mean, I look, I did buy books. There's no question. Every software when somebody recommends a book. I remember the first business book, business book that I read was E-Myth. Oh, yeah? Um, and that was the one that got me on that path of understanding that I had to learn how to see the company as something to run itself and not mm -hmm. just something that I was sitting within and just kind of worked itself out around me. But I'll read business books maybe one a year or so. I don't really overdo it with reading business books. Mm -hmm. um, I find that actually... I'm more interested in, in learning about what other companies are doing rather than sitting through a 300 page theoretical book. Like I find the actual practical of running a company is best dealt with by talking to other people doing it. So tell us a little bit about that, talking to other people. Who do you talk to? You know, or do they come from your industry? Are they outside of the industry? Just to give us a... Well, I mean, I've lucked out. I mean, there's an event that you and I both attend uh, called Owner Camp, which uh, another studio puts on. And um, that was a great... That was a great realization that there were other people out there who were just as willing as I was to sit down in a room and share openly. So right now I would say most of my attention that I'm doing towards kind of doing that is with similar web or agency related people. But it's a good point. Maybe it would make sense to actually start to do that with people in different industries. Maybe we could learn from each other from, you know, from a different point of view. Right. right. Um, how big is the studio? 12 people. 12 people. Yeah. Um, is there at a point at which you think that it'll be too much or it's too little? What's the, the magic number for you? Well, I would say the magic number right now is what it's been. In other words, I know how to run a 10 to 15 person studio. I've been doing it for, our studio's been about that size for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of got that down. Now the question now is what happens next? Do I just say that's what we're going to do and that's what we're going to be forever? No. I mean, I don't have grand aspirations to get to 50 or 100. Mm -hmm. but. You know, I'd like to see, to challenge myself to maybe go 15 to 20 and see what that feels like. And then see what happens after that. With right. That. When, um, when you think of your leadership style or the, maybe, maybe how other people would describe you, give us an indication of what that style might be in a, in a phrase or... 
Uh, lead by example. Lead by example. That's, that's the first and foremost way I see it. In other words, um, I want my team to know that I'm willing to do anything that they're doing. I'm not above anything. I'm not above any task. And I want them to feel that I'm with them and I'm just as willing to, to do it. Uh, and I think by doing that, people understand that, that there's there's not a real, uh, that leadership for me is not separate from the team. In other words, I've always seen us as a really flat organization so that I happen to be the leader by default and I happen to be there first. I happen to be the one who's, who's just there, but it doesn't mean that that I'm above or, or beyond wherever anybody else is in our team. Okay, and, so, so part of that um, taking, even if you are a flat business, you still need some direction. Tell yeah. us a little bit about how you figure out what that direction is, how you plan for that. What what does strategic planning look like for you guys, if anything? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there definitely is, and there is more and more. I mean, I think as I've learned more and more getting what I would call an on-the-job MBA, you start to pick up those things as time goes on. So you start to learn, oh, okay, so here's what business development. So you know business development is a word, uh, two words. Then you start to learn about how other people are doing it. And you realize, okay, so these are the things I'm doing right, these are the things I'm not doing right, these are things I can improve on. Same thing with marketing and different elements. So it's constant evolution, constantly learning to figure out how to get to, to get better at each of different parts of what you're doing. And are you primarily responsible for planning or is it a company-wide thing? Uh, I would say that I'm responsible for it. I, I completely involve key members of the team and sometimes everybody mm -hmm. um, in getting their opinions but a lot of the times the team is there to do their job and they've been hired to do a job and when I hired them I didn't say oh by the way part of your job is helping to run the company so people who have opinions are totally welcome to give them to me but there are a lot of times I'll ask a question and I won't get anything back and when I don't then I take that as they're saying to me we trust you to make that decision for us as a team so let's talk about team yeah that's obviously the critical part of a service business yeah like yours um, how do you get that team together how do you keep them together Tell us a little bit about the culture at Pank. Yeah, so one of the things I'm proudest of is how long a lot of my members of my team have been serving. So I have, who's now, I've just over, just recently brought him on as a partner, the longest serving employee we have. He's been with us 14 years. So he's been brought in as a partner um, because he pretty much now runs the company, like on a day-to-day -day production level. So when it comes to production and running the office, that's his baby. Um, and as far as getting the team together, we're very selective. In other words, when a job comes open, we don't kind of rush to fill it with the first person who comes to the door. We're willing to, first of all, take the time to interview the person. So it's usually I interview them, other members of the team, and eventually more people on the team, um, you know, bring them on. I also, the culture I try to instill is that the way we describe it is, if we're hiring you, we want you to stay. In other words, we want people to be there for a long time. So that people come through, I understand that's part of the deal. Having done this 15 years, there have been tons of people who come through the business, but I have three I have three people who have been with us over 10 years, and I have another three to four who have been with us over five years. So I'm trying to keep people for the long term. That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit more about culture. Yeah. Did it, was it something that evolved on its own? Was it something that you crafted very specifically? Um, I don't, I mean, I guess you can force culture by doing certain things, but putting a foosball in a room doesn't create culture. You know, taking people to a restaurant doesn't create culture. Culture is created by the people in the room at that time. So if you have a room of people who are non-political and, and, and have each other's backs, that's the culture of the company it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way we are. I would, I would describe to my benefit or detriment, we've generally hired more introverted people and maybe that's a little bit more my personality, although I'm trying to get out of that mode. So the team is really kind of calmer, quieter. There's no, it's not an aggressive team. It's a real team about people helping each other. Um, but yes, if we got X group of people together, the culture would be very different. Yeah, okay, good. So uh, let's then come back to you. Yeah. Um, how do you find some balance in your life? Because you know, running your own business can be stressful. What's, what, where do you get your, your peace and quiet and, and how do you find uh, time for yourself? Well, I mean, even when there's busy time. So right now we're having a really busy time where I, my hours are really, uh, I'm working longer hours over the past few months. That's just how things go, it goes up and down. Um, what I ensure for myself is I make sure that when I have time to myself, it's very isolated time. So as a more of an introverted person, I thrive on downtime. I don't thrive on uptime. Mm -hmm. So the uptime is an energy suck for me, so that I need to always have very specific downtime to recharge my battery. So I'll ensure that I will always have a certain amount of time during a day 
on a weekend that I can recharge myself and have that energy so that I don't deplete or stress myself out long term. And what, just explain to me like what the downtime looks like. Are you, you know, <laughs> you know, is it meditation? Is it something less exciting than that? I would say it's less exciting. I mean, you know, it's like I live in a city, so I love to go for long walks, and I can just walk for a couple hours, clear my air, clear my head, and maybe that is almost meditative at certain mm. points. Uh, like video games, still, you know, I still love to just sit down and spend a couple hours and just remove my mind from the day-to-day -day work, and that works great. I know other people, it's different things, but those are the kind of things like, you know, reading. Reading is another big one where I spend a lot of time just like turning off from digital and going in, even though it's on an iPad, just sitting and reading a book and trying to read as much as I can. Good. So, as, um, as somebody in a leadership position, as, an, as a mentor, you could, you could even say, mm -hmm. those people that are up and coming both within your organization and in the industry, yeah. um, probably are thinking, how can I do this? What, what might you say to those people? Um, well, I mean, the, I'd say the hardest thing is to, be, is to really be able to honestly look at yourself and decide if that's something that you can realistically do. Not everybody's a leader, and I think that's fine. I think that you know, maybe when you get out of school or when you get into the business world, you're all hoping you're gonna be a leader, or you're hoping you're gonna to wanna to run a business. But the reality is it's important to look at yourself and say, is this really what I wanna be doing? Um, if it is, and you feel passionate about it, then I think it's something to do. If you're doing it because society says that's what you're supposed to do and you're supposed to run a business to get wealthy, but it's not really part of who you are, don't do it. Find another thing to do. Work with somebody where you can grow your skills in different ways. In my case, I didn't really see it as a leadership thing at first. I saw it more as I just wanted to work for myself. And that was the first thing. And I just felt like I would do better in charge of my own life rather than having somebody else, you know, kind of lay it out for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a certain amount of ego, a certain amount of inability to want to work for somebody else, even though with clients we are working for somebody else, it's just that feeling of control of your own, your own destiny. Okay. What, uh, what do you think is still missing from your quiver of talents or skills that you need to do a good uh, job? Uh, without a doubt, the thing as a company I feel we're still weakest at, or I'm weakest at, is marketing. And I think the marketing ties into the image around myself as being more introverted, that my first natural reaction is when somebody says, hey, you did a great job, say thank you, and, and humbly say thanks. Not to be like, not, not only do I agree with you, I did the most amazing job possible. So it's, it's not, I'm not a natural self-promoter. So I've been trying to learn and figure out ways how we as a team can find a style of marketing and promotion that suits us. So, you know, the thing I'm looking at is probably over the past few, over the past year has been looking at doing kind of uh, low-key events, looking at doing some low-key thought work, and trying to find things to bring out um, the community around us that really fits us, which isn't being loud and boisterous, but being quiet and considerate and concerned. And that's, that's the way I see it. And if we take a step back and think about the industry as a whole, yep. what is the industry, you know, have for us? What is it, what's in store? What does the, the future of digital design have in store for us? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a, it's big a tough question. one. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a big question. I think um, specialization would be a good way to, to look at things. In other words, um, in talking with other other company owners, we all, we all can say things like what I said before, which is we build websites. Great. We do. There's hundreds of thousands of other companies that do. The question is, why should somebody work with us? And that's the one that I think I personally find that we all as an industry have to, have to get better at answering. In other words, what is it that makes working with Plank better than working with another company? And it isn't even better, it's a what is it about our team that fits best with that client? And some people do it by focusing on an industry, some people do it by focusing on a specific service. Um, and I think the more that we specialize, the, the better the stories are gonna get. And I think it's that storytelling that we, we all need to get a little bit better at. Any, uh, any future trends in uh, technology or design that you think are going to affect us in positive or negative ways? Well, I'd love to see a movement away from flat. I'm sick of flat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the iPhone was the, I think the iPhone hopefully was the death knell in flat design. Um, I think we hopefully be moving off into multiple different trends after that. Um, from a design perspective, I think that's probably the first one. I think interaction design, and now that the web, is, the internet is not just a series of flat pages, it's a living, breathing experience that I think interaction design is, is gonna be the key to understand how people will move differently through the internet. Awesome, good. Um, Warren, thank you very much thank for your you. insights and your time. Thank and you. Hopefully we'll see you in Boston soon. Yes, cool. all right, thanks. Thank you.